So when you are traveling to a new place, it can be incredibly helpful to look at sites and uh, apps that allow other people to rate the destinations, you know, Yelp, TripAdvisor, those kinds of places, they can be incredibly helpful. You get a sense of what something, you know, could be really meaningful. There are 1,800 five-star reviews for this place, so we definitely should look at it, that kind of thing. What's interesting to me, though, is that all the sorts of places that I don't think about in terms of customer ratings are also on these sites. Places like U.S. National Parks. So you on TripAdvisor and on Yelp can rate U.S. National Parks, which means when you allow people to rate things, there are going to be some people who love it and some people who hate it. And so an illustrator and artist named Amber Scher was looking through uh, and uh, uh, for a trip and noticed that this national park she was looking at had several one-star reviews. And she was trying to figure out who disliked a national park enough to give one-star reviews. And she found some of them that were, uh, that were so funny that she decided to illustrate examples of them. So, for example, uh, Yellowstone National Park, okay? One of the very first national park in the country, many believe in the world. Uh, it is uh, unbelievably beautiful, mostly in Wyoming. Has these natural springs, right? These springs that boil over and spring up, right? Uh, not everybody is enamored with them. In fact, one person said, uh, oh man, it worked a second ago. <laughs> one person said, save yourself some money and boil some water at home. <laughs> Didn't quite get the beauty and grandeur, I don't think. Or, for example, uh, Arches National Park in Utah. Uh, beautiful rock formations, including the, I believe this is the Delicate Arch. In fact, this is uh, so famous and so well known that Utah put it, Utah put it on their license plate, which led to the one star review. It looks nothing like the license plate. <laughs> Which I love. So that's great. Zion National Park uh, has all of these, uh, all of these beautiful formations, uh, amazing views, amazing things that you can do. And uh, the response from one person who wasn't interested is the scenery is distant and impersonal. <laughs> Which leads to the question, what are you expecting from scenery? I'm afraid you're going to live a life that has a lot of disappointment in it. Uh, if if <laughs> you look around and go, this was not very personal. And the scenery is way over there. <laughs> One star. So, and then, of course, the big one, the Grand Canyon. That's me right there. Uh, the Grand Canyon. Uh, <laughs> Over uh, this uh, this amazing, unbelievable experience, uh, the gorge you know made by uh, made by this river. At one point, it's 18 miles across. It's a mile deep from the top to the bottom. It is beautiful in every possible way that you can imagine. If you have been there, it is the epitome of, used in the correct way, the word awesome, right? Awe-inspiring. It, it is beyond description. It is beyond measure. It is just a, a gift from God. Or it is... A hole. A very, very large hole. One star. Can you imagine, if you have been to the Grand Canyon, can you imagine looking around at the Grand Canyon and going, eh, I mean... We put a fence up in my yard before there were holes for the you know, posts. Uh, it's just a bigger version of that, right? And now imagine a weird world where these one-star reviews were the things where you were trying to describe to somebody the experience of what these national parks were like. One of the ones that I didn't use that still makes me laugh is uh, the Sequoia National Park, the huge trees that have been there hundreds of years. The one-star reviews were, the one-star review was, 
there are bugs here and they will bite you in the face. <laughs> what if the way that you describe Sequoia National Park was there are bugs here? Well, y yeah. Or, I mean, you can go to this place if you want, but the scenery is impersonal and distant. <laughs> or, should I go to Yellowstone? No, just save yourself some time. Boil water at home. It's the same experience. I hear good things about the Grand Canyon. Pfft, you mean the big hole in the ground? <laughs> I don't think so. When you describe it in this kind of way, you leave so much out. In fact, you leave so much out that you've shaped it and shaped and flattened this description and flattened this experience so much that it turns it into something you wouldn't want to do. I mean, have you heard somebody come back and talk about the Grand Canyon and talk about how amazing it is and talk about how beautiful it is? And then you'd hear somebody say, it's just a very, very large hole. That's all it is. The difference between those two, those two ideas, those two pictures that are drawn is dramatic. And the difference between whether that's something you'd want to engage in, something you'd want to follow in, something you'd want to look forward to doing, look forward to experiencing, most likely, if you were left with this, it wouldn't be very much, right? So we are finishing up our series Chris or Maddie, I'm just going to have you push the next button. Okay, there we go. I give up. So uh, we're finishing up our series called From the Garden to the City. What we are doing is we are looking at the major movements of Scripture. We are taking the Bible and trying to examine and make sense of what is God doing from like a 30,000 foot view. Obviously, we spend lots of times in individual scriptures trying to figure out what's God doing for my life? What does this make sense? How is God calling me to live? But if we don't have a big sense of the story, a big sense of what we find ourselves in, then we can wind up with wrong ideas about God. We can wind up with wrong directions of where we're supposed to go. We can have all sorts of mistakes and problems. It is incredibly helpful to know the big major movements of scripture. So we started a few weeks ago talking about the first one is creation, that God created everything in the world. God looked around and God said, it is good. God created us. God created humanity. And instead of just saying, okay, check, humans done, God said to humanity, I want you to do more. I want you to be more. I want you to create with me. I want you to co-create. I want you to be a part of shaping and forming how this world could be. I want you to choose to love me not be forced into it. So, after creation, the next, uh, the next movement we get is the idea of the fall. This idea that when God invites us to freely choose to love God, that also implies that God gives us the choice to not love God. That God gives us the choice to turn away and to do things on our own. When we turn away, when we choose to do things or not do things that displease God, that separate us from God, then we are engaging in sin. And we talked about sin is this, this force, this activity, this idea, this thing that separates us from the good co-creator that God has called us to be. The role and the place and the idea of who God wants us to be is distorted and warped and broken by sin. That sin separates us from God, it separates us from each other, and it separates us from the world. That is what sin does. It causes us to curve in on ourself. It causes us to struggle with how to, how to understand and how to live because we only think of ourselves. And everything we do has to be filtered through what's going to appease my ego and how, what's going to build my kingdom. That's what sin does, is it separates us. After God created everything beautifully, sin enters the world and separates us from God, and that moves us to the third movement where God says, I refuse to let that be the last word. I refuse to let that be the ending point. I am going to make a way. And God makes a way for us to come back to him through Jesus. 
Jesus, God's son, comes and lives and dies and rises again. He takes on the sin of the world. Everything that you have done and I have done and the whole world has done that separates us from God, Jesus takes it on so that we can be reconciled. We can be brought back into the right relationship with God if that's what we choose. If that's what we want, to be brought back into the way that we are supposed to be and the way that we are supposed to live, if that's what we want, then God has made a way for us to have that. So we have creation and the fall and reconciliation. And now, over here... We have restoration, the end of all things. But between reconciliation and restoration is where we find ourselves now, okay? So we are right here. All of this we have looked back to to understand God's movement and God's work, but now we look ahead and we anticipate what God is going to do in the future. So we look ahead and we see and we look to Scripture to show us what the reconciliation, what, what the restoration, what God bringing everything back together is going to look like. And the best place for us to understand how God is going to bring everything back together and wrap it all up at the end is to look at the very last book of the Bible, Revelation. Now, a word about Revelation. <laughs> the people who are laughing are the people who have read Revelation or experienced Revelation because Revelation uh, was written by the Apostle John, one of the original disciples who was separated. He, um, he has been sent off to the island of Patmos, separated from the congregation that he leads, and on this island, separated from his congregation by the Romans. The Roman, Im, the Roman Empire has, uh, is persecuting Christians and kicking him off to this island. Over in this island, God reveals visions to him that he writes down so that he can send back and share. Now, some of these visions are in, in as holy a preacherly way you can, wacky. Just some wacky, wild and wacky stuff going on here. And we have, uh, we being all humanity, has puzzled over the book of Revelation for a long, 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 long time. My mentor, uh, because... You know, you can, you can have the silly left behind books. You can have all these different things that people do that, that interpret Revelation. My mentor always talked about that you can get so lost in the weeds of those books and that interpretation stuff that you can miss the bigger point. Um, one of the big TV preachers that uh, when I was flipping around a long time ago, he used to do these big revelation series and he had like this huge chart, like starting over here and going all the way across this huge stage. And he used one of those telescoping pointer things to like whack different parts of it that he was talking about. You can get so lost in the woods with it that you forget the main point of Revelation is that God wins. Okay? God wins. This is the big deal. We can talk details. We need to talk details. But you need to not lose the thread. God wins. Okay? But for us to understand and reflect on what the very end is going to be, how God is going to restore all things back to the way God wants them, we are going to look at the very end of the Bible, which means we look at the very end of the book of Revelation. So uh, this will be easy to find in your Bible, hopefully. If you go to the maps, you've gone too far. But you need to, you need to if you have your Bible, you're invited to turn and look with us to the book of Revelation. We're going to start in chapter 21. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw, this is John uh, talking, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Uh, pause right here. No longer any sea, it's not because uh, 
John hated the beach. It's because the sea represented chaos and destruction. If you remember back in the very first chapter, uh, God goes over the chaos of the waters as he's creating. So this is hearkening back to the very first chapter of Genesis, where all of what was around before God created stuff was chaos in the waters. Now there's no more water. Why? Because there's no more chaos. Okay? Two, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, out of the skies from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and he himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give, a drink, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son or daughter. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So, and then uh, we, if you zoom down and look through, uh, especially verses 16 and on, you get a lot of descriptions. So let's do 16 a little bit. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. It measured the city with a, he measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it was long. He measured its wall and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was Jasper, and the second was Sapphire. The third was Chalcedony. Oh, I love Chalcedony, don't you? The fourth, Emerald. The fifth, Sardonyx. The sixth, Carnelian. The seventh, Chrysolite. The eighth, Beryl. The ninth, Topaz. The tenth, Chrysophrase. And the eleventh, Jacinth. And the twelfth, Amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl, and the great street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Okay, so, uh, at the end of all time, at the end of everything, what's going to happen is God is going to bring down a new city, a new way for us to be dwelling and living with God forever. Now, the... I would imagine that if you're paying attention here, there are several questions, right? Question one being, there's a word that's not been mentioned really in terms of how you, how you name this new city. It's the word that we all tend to use when we're talking about uh, all the good people who die, where do they go? Heaven, right? The city is called New Jerusalem. Where did heaven go? Right? So that's your first question is, wait, where did, where did, where did heaven go? So heaven was the, the um, book of Revelation was the last book written in the Bible. Everybody up to this point, when they were talking about where did God dwell, where were you going to go and be with God, the word they used was heaven. This is the new heaven. This is new Jerusalem. Now, second question. Part A and Part B of question number two. Why is it called New Jerusalem? What happened to Old Jerusalem, right? Well, it's called New Jerusalem because we are part of one gigantic big story here, right? We started in a garden and we came all the way to this city. Jerusalem, if you remember your Old Testament into New Testament history, Jerusalem was the city where the temple was. Why did the temple matter? Because the temple is where God dwelt. God dwelt there in that particular place, in that particular city. 
Why is it called New Jerusalem? Well, because this was written about 100 AD, if not somewhere around there. And in 70 AD, after 10 or 11 different rebellion attempts, including the one that they would have talked about and chalked up to Jesus, the Romans finally had enough and completely destroyed Jerusalem. They completely abolished the city of Jerusalem and they put a pagan city in its place. So imagine, if you would, the place in the city where God's supposed to dwell, now filled with people who either actively despise or don't know anything at all about God. For the people who are faithful and who believe that God is coming back and who believe that God is going to live and dwell, there are, especially if you grew up as a Jew who followed the Torah and followed the Old Testament, there would be few things more powerful than the idea of this city, this place, where only the good are allowed in, where only God's people come. This is the new Jerusalem. This is better than the old Jerusalem because the entire city is where God dwells. Do you hear and see all of the different examples and explanations about what this city is like and what it means? For me, the third question then, and I'm, I'm fascinated by this because I experience it too. This is not a judgment on anybody at all because I've heard this from multiple people and not just in this congregation. When you're really honest with me, and we talk, not in a sermon like this, but we talk about heaven, when you're really, 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 really honest with me, the really honest people will say some version of, can you describe, like, can, can you give me a better picture of heaven? Because it's, and, and they look around to make sure no super holy person is around, and they go, it sounds boring. Why does it sound boring, I ask? Well, if I'm walking around in a robe all day with a harp and there's streets of gold, that's not what I want to do. That's not, that doesn't feel, that feels so completely different from who I am and what I, and what's up with that? So I think what we have when we think of heaven And now I'm going to ask you to think of heaven with this new Jerusalem. When we think of that, I think what we have is the big hole in the ground problem. Is that we have flattened out the definition of what this experience is like so much that not only do we not want it, but we sure aren't going to be selling it to very many other people, right? Who's ready to go play harp music eternally? Come on! People? I read all of those random, I know, I'm sure you were wondering why I was reading all of that random description of New Jerusalem. I get it. Precious stones. Let's move on. I, I did all of that so that I could, I could show you at the very end, the very last part tagged on at the very end is the part about the streets of gold, right? The streets of gold is not the main selling point of New Jerusalem. All of this is simply an explanation of the extravagance of what it feels like and looks like for God to live with us. The most powerful picture of the New Jerusalem for me is the idea that there is no death, no pain, no mourning, no tears. In fact, God himself wipes the tears out of your eyes. How would you not want to experience that forever? How would you not want to be with God forever? Here's the other thing people say. We're going to be worshiping God forever in heaven, and they really can't admit it. But the honest part of that next thing is, I don't want to sit in a worship service for all of eternity. (laughs) See, some of you are laughing. Some of you are completely uncomfortable laughing. But the truth is, I don't want to sit in a worship service for all of eternity. But I bet you do want to experience what it is like to have no pain and no death and no tears and no, no problems, no fears, no struggles, no aches, no issues, no, none of those things that cause us to grieve both in ourselves and for our world. Could you imagine what it would be like to be in God's presence so fully and so completely that you are swallowed up in the love that God has for you? Our brains can't even begin to process it. We can only catch glimpses of it here and there. There are moments where you feel like heaven is here on earth and it is joyful. Imagine that 
a million times infinity forever. When we talk about harps and robes, streets of gold, we're describing the Grand Canyon like a big hole in the ground. We are missing the bigger picture of what the new, of what the new Jerusalem is. The new Jerusalem is hearkening back to creation. It is God back here saying, this is how I want it to be forever. Sin breaks us apart. God through Jesus brings us back and Restoration is the way that God meant it to be forever. We are living and dwelling with God forever. And this is the good news for us, is that God's deepest desire is for us to be connected, us to be woven in with him and all of the struggles and problems and difficulties that this world throws at us. All of those are banished forever. How could you not want that? In the first chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the apostle Paul talks about that he struggles with this. He struggles because he deeply desires to go be with God right now, but he knows that all of the churches need him. And it struck me as I was reading that the other day, uh, you know, we, um, there's a book written a, a while ago about, uh, we all want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And some of that, you know, I, look, I'm not looking to die right now. I, I want to see how Piper and Andy grow. I want, to, I want to spend more and more years with Sarah. I want to see more and more. I'm not ready to go yet. But when I think about how people talk about death, we oftentimes fall into the cultural trap of fear. And we fall into the cultural trap of this worry about death when in reality, shouldn't there be this sense and this anticipation of when we get to be with God, it will be like this new Jerusalem forever. I'm not saying that you want to just chuck it all away and go right now, but I'm saying there should be a sense in us where we don't see the Grand Canyon as just a hole in the ground. We see the Grand Canyon as this awe-inspiring, unbelievable thing that you have to experience to even wrap your brain around it. And even then, words don't do it justice. New Jerusalem is like that. It's not about harps. It's not about gold. It's not about sitting in a worship service. It is about the presence of God with you forever, with nothing separating you, and you being right with him always. How could we not want that? How could we not be eager for that? How could we not be seeking that? Because this is the movement and the story of the Bible, that from the beginning, God's desire for us was to be in relationship and communion and connection with him forever. And he has made the way for that to happen. And he is inviting you to be part of this new city, this new way, this new understanding. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. Not because, ha, we finally did it and you suckers are left here. Not because we finally get our robe and our harp, but because those moments that we experience now where God's presence seems so close, where we are blessed because there are these thin moments where the rest of the world falls away and you feel holiness around you, that will be every single day in the new Jerusalem. That is what the new reality looks like. And that is forever and ever and ever. How could we not yearn for that? How could we not work towards that? How could we not invite every single person we know to experience that goodness and grace as well? This is God's desire for us. The garden, were two, it was two people. The city is for everyone who wants to come and experience the presence and the goodness and, and the love of God forever. We are moving from the garden to the city because when we look through scripture, we can't help but be caught up in this story that God's desire for us here and now is for us to look back at all that God has done and look forward and anticipate what God is going to do and join in with that goodness so that when we experience the new Jerusalem, that is what our life will be like forever. That is what eternity will be. The sense of God's presence where there is no death and no pain and no mourning, where all is right forever. That's what we want. That's what we're seeking. 
That's what God is restoring us to. Would you pray with me? God, you have called us to be part of your grand story. You have invited us to be part of your narrative. You are preparing a place for us even now. God, give us the right eyes to see and understand your new Jerusalem. Give us hearts that are eager to anticipate and experience that goodness with you forever and motivate us, God, to live in such a way that our actions, our words, and our thoughts point to you and the goodness of you. God, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us that we do not deserve to be redeemed, to be reconciled, and to be restored. We pray, God, that you will transform our work and our lives and our offering so that the rest of the world can see your good news as well. We anticipate, God, serving and loving you forever. We rejoice, God, with the opportunity that we will have to be with you. And we pray, God, that you give us the courage to share that vision with the world. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.